So Pierre, um, Pierre is a computer scientist. He's at UC Irvine. Uh, he's now the director of the UCI Institute for Genomics and Bioinformatics. Uh, one of the things he's going to tell us about is invariance for other modalities, I assume not just vision. And he's also going to discuss um, things like weight sharing and biological systems, which uh, relates to some of the models that you heard about today, especially from folks like Jan. So with that, Pierre, you have 10 minutes, and I'll set your time. Thank you. I, I want to thank uh, Lorenzo and Tommy for inviting me to this uh, very interesting uh, workshop. I'll just make a few uh, remarks with the purpose of, of stirring some, some leads, maybe uh, some, some, some debate around two questions. And the first one is around uh, a, a, a quote from Tommy, actually, when he came to visit us a few years ago. If we solve computer vision, we have pretty much solved AI. I'm sure many of you must have heard similar uh, statements. And uh, of course, we understand what the statement means, and it has a, it's, it's, a, it's a philosophical statement, if you want, so it's perhaps better for, for happy hours after the, the panel. But uh, for this group that is so much uh, focused on vision, you could ask this question. If we solve computer audition, have we solved AI? And even worse, to disgust you, if we solve computer olfaction, have we solved AI? And also, I'd like Tommy or, or someone else in the audience to perhaps sketch, even in very, very uh, vague uh, terms, how would you go from a machine that solves computer vision to a machine that can uh, prove uh, Fermat's, Fermat's last theorem? Of course, if we go down to invariances, this suggests looking at invariances in other modalities and um, audition as, as a computer audition has been uh, mentioned in, in some of the talk, but of course there is also olfaction. We know that olfaction is the oldest sense, so perhaps uh, there is something uh, to be learned in, in looking also at invariances in olfaction and, and connections to, to the other systems. Um, maybe there is also something to be learned uh, uh, from the things we're not invariant to. Uh, Tommy said we are still evolving, so there is a chance we, we, we may learn those two one day. But uh, in each uh, modality, there are well-known transformations uh, to which we're not invariant. For instance, if you, if you give molecules that are mirror images of, of each other to, the, to your nose, they will smell completely differently in, in, in general. And so although this is not very sexy for funding agencies, I think there is something to be learned also to to in try to building artificial systems that are invariant to different combinations of, 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 of operators, even those that you don't see in the, in the natural system, and build a visual system that can recognize faces upside down, for instance, or things of, of, of that sort. So by mixing the transformations to which you want to be invariant to in artificial system, maybe there is something to learn. Um, very rapidly, let me shift to the second topic, artificial neural network versus biological neural networks. In the 50s, in the 80s, we na naively thought that these were potentially one-to-one -one good models of biological neurons. Um, then there was a sort of uh, swing of the, of the pendulum. Of course, many neuroscientists, computational neuroscientists, pointed out that these are much more complex objects. You can model them with compartment models, with thousands of compartments, uh, multiple conductances. Uh, very complex dendritic trees, et cetera, et cetera, uh, spikes, uh, refractory periods, and, and, and so people started attaching the word artificial to, to these kinds of objects. But uh, today you see a movement in the, in the other direction. In fact, I was quite surprised to see in Tommy's uh, talk, basically he was using these kinds of, of neurons who were uh, coming out naturally from, from, from this approach. And, and there have been experiments even in, in the late 80s from Zipser and, and Anderson showing that if you train these kinds of networks using biological data, you get receptive fields or responses that are somewhat similar to the, to the biology in the sensory system, also in the motor system. So what is really going on here? Do, do we have some understanding? And of course, this carries to the learning rules, HEB rule or back propagation, how, how plausible, how biological they are. I think this is a question that is uh, really important in, in, our, in our field and, and needs uh, more discussion. Um, convolutional architectures use weight sharing. That's the fundamental trick for translation in, in invariance, for instance. And 
you may suspect that exact weight sharing is not very biological. How could you have synaptic have exactly the same values, etc.? And so I think there is room there for, for perhaps quantifying deviation from exact weight sharing both in the natural systems and the artificial system. Some of it has been done, but I think there is more that can be done. And of course, during learning, you could relax the exact weight sharing and, and all kinds of things of that sort uh, perhaps could be studied uh, more carefully. Uh, let me show you another invariance that, that hasn't been uh, touched upon, but if you connect a bunch of neurons uh, symmetrically, like in a Boltzmann machine, Hoffield model, etc., you know that there is a quadratic energy function. And in the state space of the system, where you are in the hypercube and the vertices uh, correspond to the various states of the system, you basically get an acyclic orientation which is determined by this energy. You draw an arrow from point uh, A to point B if the energy of A is greater than B, and the dynamic of the system is to converge towards stable points. Furthermore, as in the Hoffield model, you can use Hebb rule to store memories in this system, which is, just means scouting the energy so that you have local minima at, 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 at the memory, that you're trying, uh, memory point that you're trying to store. And so you can ask a very simple question is, if you apply a HEB rule for storing memories, how does it behave with respect to isometries of the hypercube? So in other words, if I apply HEB rule and then I do an isometry of the hypercube, I permute coordinates or I multiply uh, 1 into minus 1, or if I apply the isometry and then I apply a HEB rule, what happens to the uh, cyclic orientation of the, of, the, of the hypercube? And you can see that the diagram commutes. So both ways, whichever way you go, you get the same a cyclic orientation of the hypercube. So this is an invariance of a learning rule uh, with respect to the state base, the, the orientation in this case of, of the system. And finally, I want to say a few things about, uh, about uh, deep learning. We have algorithms for shallow learning. So if you're trying to learn a single layer, that's well understood. You have perceptron algorithm, uh, we draw off, gradient descent, uh, linear regression, you name it. So we know how to train a single layer. If you have two layers, I think all the talks this morning were basically about training two-layer systems, so autoencoders, uh, for instance. And the problem there is NP-complete, but you can do it with all kinds of approximation and, again, basically uh, gradient descent. The question is really when you go beyond that and you're trying to learn uh, many layers. And if you're trying to learn the weights in this layer, if I gave you the targets here, you would be able to do it because you would reduce the problem to shallow learning. So basically, you can see that deep learning is equivalent to deep targets. How do you give targets to layers that are deep inside the system? It's really the, the same questions from questions seen from two angles. And of course, backpropagation is a way of giving targets. You can write it as a, as a deep target algorithm instead of backpropagation. But another thing you could do is simple sampling. So by that, what I mean is you take your input, you propagate here. You don't know what's the target. You can do sampling in this layer, propagate forward. You get a sample in the output. You know in supervised learning what is the best sample. And now you just go back, you feed back here what is the best sample in the output that should be in this layer, the corresponding value in this layer, and use that for training. So that's a very simple uh, sampling strategy. And you, know, you can get it to work. You can train, we have trained networks with 40 layers doing uh, this, which you cannot do by backpropagation, or even things that are not differentiable if you are threshold gates. So for certain things, you, you can get it to work, but it is faced by, uh, a ma the major problem is the sampling. Because if you are in very high dimensional spaces, of course, the sampling is, is not very efficient. So for practical, to beat the standard benchmarks, I wouldn't recommend using uh, this algorithm. It's more of a, of a theoretical idea. But in practice, as far as you can tell so far, nothing works better than, than uh, backpropagation. And in spite of the vanishing gradient problem that, that uh, backpropagation has, and which has been pushed back by, by GPUs and, 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 and other things. Of course, the other annoying thing about backpropagation is that Newton could have done it as a, as a homework. Um, so that is, is something that, of course, uh, our, our ego doesn't like too much. But the fact is that it's still the best algorithm that we have for training a uh, deep system, as Jan has shown uh, many times, and, and nothing seems to be better than propagation. So perhaps it's not 
not entirely surprising because you're training a system with a lot of parameters. It's a high dimensional system. If you try to do perturbation or search at random in this space, it's very inefficient. You are essentially orthogonal to the gradient. And so the only way to find your way around a little bit and to improve things is to follow, find the gradient if you can or, or some approximation to it. And that seems to be the reason why it, it is uh, still the, the best algorithm we have. So the question is, is it um, even remotely uh, plausible? Is backpropagation plausible? And for a long time, I thought it was not very plausible. And I'm starting to have some doubts about that, first of all, because of its success, but also because of other things. And I want to mention something Jan already uh, brought up, which is this uh, dropout algorithm, which is a randomization algorithm that can be used to train uh, deep networks, where you present an example to the system, delete half of the neurons, uh, train the remaining ones, bring another example, delete randomly another set of neurons, half of the neurons, train the remaining connections. And you keep doing that, of course, sharing the weights. And there is beautiful uh, mathematics that I won't go through it in, in the system, but uh, um, one of the key equations, which is here. So, so drop out when you have a linear model, is nothing more than coordinate descent. This is not that mysterious. It's nice that it works, but I mean, you, you can make this. No, you have to make very careful. You have an approximation when you do drop out. Yeah, linear model, it's Before simple, it's so but if you have sigmoidals, you have to make, there is some uh, careful approximation here but that you have, have to they bounce. Have, they have max, they don't have sigmoidals. One, one version is with sigmoidal, right? I'm just saying, because it was just sigmoidal. Yeah, I mean, you could do it with whatever, but really, it's, just, it's not that, it's not, I don't know. With nonlinear function, you have to prove that it's an approximation to the ensemble, you know, with mathematical bounds. In any case, the, the point I want to make is that if you look at the sort of linear part of, of dropout, which is what you're bringing up, it looks exactly like backpropagation, where you have these probabilities that in the backpropagation pass are uh, replaced by the derivative of the sigmoidal function. This suggests that you could use dropout or spiking neurons in the backward pass. And we, we, we have tried that, and it doesn't improve over backpropagation, but at least it shows that the backpropagation can be done very robustly. It doesn't have to be super precise gradients, et cetera, which to me is a sign that perhaps there is some plausibility in backpropagation applied to, to biological systems. Thank you.